Hello and welcome to Live Day Profiles. I'm Brian Howard. We're here at the LAS Motion Picture Studio in Provo, Utah. And joining me today is Gail Sears. Gail, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Gail is an author. She's also a playwright, has done acting as well. <laughs> uh, you may have no seen some of her books recently. Sister Preachers is a recent one. Belonging to Heaven, later Letters in a Jade Dragon Box. And, other, and there's lots more as well. Uh, we met through the Latter-day Saint Publishers and Media Association, Latter-day Saints and Publishing and Media and the Arts. Now we've changed the name. I no, I didn't change it. The name's <laughs> mentioned. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about your background. I was looking at you grew up in some pretty nice climates, Lake Tahoe, spent some time in Hawaii. What was life yeah. like for you growing up? You know, it was kind of magical. I really had a magical childhood. Uh, lake Tahoe, if you know of it, is beautiful mm -hmm. with the beautiful lake. And then when I was about 12, my mom and I moved to Hawaii, and that's where I ended up graduating from high school. And, of course, that's a beautiful place, too. So, yeah, it kind of, um, I was kind of always a creative little craziness mm -hmm. when I was young, and I think that only added to that, uh, that spirit of creativity and stuff to grow up in those places so it was great yeah what kind of stuff you're able to do i mean i'm in hawaii maybe the beach and things like that it sounds like a lot learn to surf yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a while ago <laughs> yeah surfing was uh, big on my list i loved my high school had a great drama teacher uh mr nakamoto that kind of spurred my love for theater so yeah when i graduated from high school and decided where I was going to go to college, I really wanted to go into theater as a profession. So, yeah. that, And so high school kind of inspired you to do that. Were you in yeah. plays and such in high school? I was. I was. Any, any favorites? Do you remember? Um, well, there was one, uh, Once Upon a Mattress, which was a musical. And I got to play this bird mm -hmm. that lulls the princess to sleep, right? So that was fun. <laughs> had all these feathers, and <laughs> they hoisted me up above the, you know, above the stage, and then lowered me down. It was very, really fun. So I mean, all of those experiences are wonderful. Sounds like yeah. fun. So you decided to go to BYU mm -hmm. and into drama, uh, and you were doing playwriting. What drew you to that? Uh, doing playwriting, or was it the whole acting drama experience that you were interested in? Well, um, yeah, I loved the acting portion of it. But I also loved the directing portion of it. And I, I think Ms. Uh, Dr. Whit uh, Charles Whitman was one of my inspirations. Mm -hmm. And he kind of suggested that I start writing little plays and things like that. And I just really got into the um, focus and it just mesmerized me to create these stories that could come alive on stage. So that's kind of where I started. Mm. Did you get uh, to have any of those plays performed that you wrote? I did. Oh, okay. I did. In fact, Dr. Whitman um, did Celestial 2A, which was one of my first dramas that I'd written. Mm. So he directed that, and it was fun. What, what was your goal when you were, you were thinking, I'm going to do this professionally, I'm going to act, or what, what, what did you have in mind? Mm. Oh, to be a professional actress, right? <laughs> Now that uh, it didn't pan out, but you know the basic, the basis that it gave me for my life was amazing. I went on to go to the University of Minnesota and get a master's degree in theater arts. That was quite an experience. So yeah, was it's that kind great. of like the hot cold treatment? So you've been in Hawaii and Lake Tahoe, and now you go to Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> I said to my husband when we moved there, I said, "Where did you move me on the dark side of the moon?" It was yeah, it was cold. So oh, why did you decide to go there? Uh, George's work, my husband, George. And when did, when did you meet George, your husband? BYU. <laughs> was he involved in drama at all? Oh, or? no. We are total opposites. <laughs> he, um, he was in math and business, and uh, we met through our student ward. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> we didn't think so at first, but... Yeah, it was. A, it's a good match. We've been married 52 years, so yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Somehow it worked. Yeah. How was the experience there in Minnesota? What kind of things did you get to do there? Um, I directed several things. Uh, I wrote my first adaptation of a play. I wrote the adaptation for Bluebird, which is a play by uh, Maurice Maeterlinck, and uh, that was produced at the University of Minnesota. Um, so, yeah, acted in different different plays and 
it was just fun, really intense experience yeah. because I had two kids at the time. Mm. And uh, so it was it that was a lot challenge. of shuffle, <laughs> yeah, shuffling and getting my priorities straight. So yeah, it, was, yeah. it was great. So when did uh, writing come into play? So you had these experiences. Now you're having a family. Yeah. When did you guys start, start writing? Uh, well, here's an interesting thing. I was writing plays, right? Mm. And then I got to a point, um, especially when we moved back to Utah, I was still involved in theater. In fact, I was in the original production of uh, Savior of the World. Oh, yeah. I played Mary's mother. Oh, wow. So it was a great experience. But I, you know how the Lord will take you from one track and just kind of move you over here? Well, I had a play that I'd written that just didn't fit the genre. So I thought, well, I'd never delved into, um, like, uh, fiction writing or anything but I said well this might make a fun book so I started writing out chapters and that actually became my first book that was it, it's called Autumn Sky and it was um, per, um what's the word published published thank you <laughs> I'm I'm into the realm of theater so now I have to go to the realm of books yeah published by Covenant mm. so my first three books were with Covenant and then from then on Deseret Book took me over and yeah tell me about that experience so you've got this play you're turning into a book mm -hmm. uh where did you turn to say hey i want to get this published did they reach you did you reach out to <laughs> them how did that work here again there's been a lot brian a lot of serendipity in my life with different projects i was working at the jordan river river temple and uh one of the ladies i was working with she was talking to me about my work and what I did. And I said, well, I've written this book. And she said, well, one of my good friends is a publisher at Covenant. And can she look at it? I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I turned the manuscript over to her and she looked at it and said, yes, we'd like to publish this. And so my, my road to publishing was fairly easy. And it's a blessing. It really is a blessing. And so from then on, I just have published with both Covenant and then I went over to Deseret Book and have published like six novels with them. So a lot of jealous authors out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're involved with so many groups and so many people like, oh, how do you do it? And yeah, that was yeah. a good experience. Yeah, I've had a couple of uh, books that are contemporary, little middle grade books and stuff that I'd ha I've had to shop out to different places. And I've had some rejections. I, You know, I learned rejection when I was in theater mm. because I auditioned for a lot of different shows and was rejected. So I think it's just part of being a creative person. You just have to learn to take that rejection. So it's okay. You know, it's interesting, you know, you're going to school, you figure yourself, oh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an actress, I'm a playwright. At what point did you think, oh, I'm an author. <laughs> Did that, when there was a book published or then you published another one or is it still working on, I guess? Um, yeah, I can. It, that's a really good question because um, as writers, we do wonder when we, you know, meld over into the world of being an author mm -hmm. and thinking of ourselves as that. It takes a couple of books that are published and that people want that, yeah, you can say. I'm an author. And I didn't come to writing novels till late in my life. I was like fi almost 50. Just a couple years When ago. I wrote my, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're so nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. When I was later on in life. But, you know, there again, when the Lord says, hmm, I kind of maybe want you to go over here. You just, yeah, mm -hmm. follow move where you're, you're, you're asked to. When, when did the idea of this historical fiction, because you have a reputation of doing some serious research. So when did you decide that might be something you're interested in? Well, my first three books, it was a trilogy, uh, dealt with World War I. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I did a lot of research into World War I, into the war, into how it affected, you know, people in the States, because we didn't join that war until later on in the, in the uh, combat. I, I loved it. Mm. I just loved digging in and finding not only the historical facts, but also the life that surrounded, you know, the, the food and the 
just everything that people, how they lived their lives. I found it fascinating. So then when I went on to do um, The Silence of God, which is, you know, I'm researching along, and it's Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm. So I wanted to go from the communism that was starting with my first three books and then take it into Russia. And I, I was just fascinated by that. And I thought, you know, I'm going to, the premise is going to be removing God from the society. And I thought, well, it'd be great if I could find an LDS family that gets caught up in that time period. And I thought that's not going to happen. Mm. So I was just going to use an Orthodox Russian um, family. But lo and behold, I find this family in my research called the Lindelof family, the one and only LDS family in Russia mm. during the Bolshevik Revolution and what happened to them. And that's the whole story behind the silence of God. Wow. So, yeah, and I tried to go to the places. My husband, cute George, <laughs> he said, where do you want to go for a, a little vacation? And I said, can we go to Russia? <laughs> <laughs> so he fi figured it out and we were on a little 10 day tour went to Russia and so it's wonderful to be in the location mm. if you can because that just tells you so much about the food the people the atmosphere what so. kind of research did it take to track out like that family how did you come about it I mean that's that's a lot of looking around and yeah. making those connections um actually thank heavens for the church history library mm. because that's where I actually found the article about the Lindelof family and then just took off from there so, wow. yeah. What is it? You know, it seems to me, uh, you just write straight fiction, you can make up worlds of your own. Because, mm -hmm. you know, what, oh, yeah. But yeah. when it's historical fiction, you're going to have nitpicky people say, no, that wouldn't have been <laughs> available then. How, how do you go about that? And do you have people like look it over and try to fact check, I guess? How do, how do you do that? You know, that is, that is such a good question. Um, and what I do is that at the end of each chapter, I put reference to um, you know, what is right on the nose, true uh, facts that I have found. And then things that you kind of sometimes have to fudge a little just for the sake of the book and for the sake of the pacing. Right. And so um, that's, I usually give them as much information as I th as they need. And I've only had a couple of times where people have come back and really kind of asked me questions or emailed me and asked me questions about things. So yeah, it pays off to <laughs> do, <laughs> do, do the groundwork. <laughs> you know, when you're coming up with the dialogue, because that's what's interesting, you know, we're not exactly sure what these people said, but we, we need to want to make it pretty accurate, but also it's got to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, what's your process of creating the dialogue between the individuals that are in your historical fiction novels? Um, it's a really good question. I think this is where theater comes into mm. play, too, because it informs me so much about dialogue. Because theater pieces are dialogue. That's pretty much what they are. And so you kind of um, learn how to get in, in the skin of these different characters. And then you just kind of try and give them the speech and the talk that they would would kind of come naturally to them. Mm. So I, I think that's helpful. I mean, <laughs> sometimes when I'm writing, I'm like up acting a, diff a certain scene in a dif different voice for a different character. And so that's kind of how I, you know, polish that so that it sounds natural, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. that's a challenge, you know, especially trying to make it sound natural. Yeah. So obviously you do a great job at it. How do you choose yeah. the topics? So you chose like the, the Russian family or mm -hmm. you know, World War. Uh, is it just an interest or do you do research and kind of look for ideas? Um. I pray about every book that I write, you know, where I'm going to go. And then I, I, you also have your products manager, like a Deseret book that we'll sit down together and we'll say, she'll say, well, what do you, you know, where do you want to go? And then we'll hash that out. Um, I think that there is a progression. For example, I did World War I and then I did the Bolshevik Revolution and really delved into communism. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I thought, well, where do I want to take communism next? So my next book was Letters in the Jade Dragon Box. Okay. And I kind of have this theme that they like me to do the first LDS people different places. So th that one was the first LDS people, uh, members of the church in, in uh, China, Hong Kong. So then 
that, that's why I went in that direction. And, oh, man, here again, serendipity, my products manager said, oh, you may want to meet a neighbor of mine, Grant Heaton, who was the first missionary to Hong Kong. Wow. And then he and his wife, when he was only 27 years old back in the 1950s, he and his wife, Luana, went to China as the um, mission president for the Southern Far East Mission. Wow. Just 27 years old. Mm -hmm. So I got to meet him. He and his wife are in their 80s now. And he, you talk about a wealth of information. Just sat at his feet and just absorbed all this information he had about China. And so... Mm -hmm. So I think you really feel, you know, we call it serendipity by hand of the Lord of taking you to different places Absolutely. and introducing you to the right people at the right time. Yep. Uh, Hawaii was George Q. Cannon's mission to Hawaii. That's belonging to heaven. So, yeah, it is kind of serendipity. So I want to ask you about Christmas for a Dollar. That's a book that you wrote, and it was also turned into a movie. Yeah. What's it like to see a book <laughs> that you write? This is kind of like playwright a little bit, so it's actually something you wrote, but now it's turned into a movie. What was that experience like? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, <clears throat> I received a call. Well, first I got an email. Can we use your box? Because there's a, a, a special box that my dad, because it's about my family. It's about mm -hmm. my dad when he was young, growing up in the Depression, and how they made gifts for each other one Christmas. He made this box for my Aunt Ruthie, and she sent me the box the year after my dad died and said, your dad made this for me one Christmas. Well, my dad had polio, and he only had one, one arm. Mm. So for him to make that box, I'm sure he had to have help, you know, holding the wood together, whatever. But that was such a special story to me. That's why I wrote mm. Letters in the J. I mean, uh, uh, Christmas for a Dollar. And... Um, I got, got this email, can we use that box in the filming? And I said, what filming? <laughs> I did not know anything about that. They'd cast the movie, they would had the director, they'd started filming. So anyway, I got involved at that point, and I was able to um, go on set and see different things and meet the actors. And so that was fun. But, you know, it's thrilling to know that people love that story. And they love it still. I mean, it's been on screen for a long time, and now it's on Peacock and whatever, yeah, yeah. Hulu. <laughs> so, yeah, it's thrilling. And I'm, I don't get really egotistical about anything because I think that ego is edging God out. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so if you do that, it's not, it's not good. You're not consecrating yourself to what the Lord wants you to do. Hmm. So if people love that story and are touched by that story, you know, that's the meaningful thing to me. So it's yeah, good. I think it'd be interesting. You're looking at actors and this is your family story. So these are, these are you, right? Yeah. You're happy with the actors or they got to portray your family. I, you know, I was basically happy with the story and with the actors. Um, the only thing they did that I would have done a little different, but I know they have to cast the people that, you know, touch them. Uh, Norman, my my dad, was 10 years old at the time he made that box, and Ruthie was like six years old. Well, in the movie, they switched ages. Ruthie was older, and my dad was younger. And that was pretty much the only thing that I wished had been different. Yeah. But I love the the what? young man that played my dad. Yeah. It was wonderful. I guess, yeah, if we're dealing with historical fiction, then, you know, uh, <laughs> some things get switched around just, just a little bit. Oh, yeah, bit. yeah. Let's talk about some of your books. Uh, one uh, more recent one, Sister Preachers, about the sister missionaries. Again, as some of the first ones, right? We don't really think about it because sister missionaries are so common. Yeah. But they were not, right? Originally. No. No. They, they, and it was a shock to them, too, when they were called. Um, I guess in England, they were having, we're talking 1898. So in England at the time, there were some um, anti Mormon sentiments brought about by this one apostate of the church in England that just was bad-mouthing everything about the church and polygamy, even though polygamy, the uh, manifesto had come out in 1890. Um, and so they had a, a call from the mission president over in England saying, you know, it would be really nice to maybe get some sister missionaries out here to show them what real Mormon women were like. 
And so that's why they called Inez and Jenny to Inez Knight and Jenny Brimhall. Those are really known names here on the BYU campus. So, now, if I understand it right, it wasn't like they called them in the office. They were or they say, "Hey, mm -hmm. we need you to go serve." Is that right? Right. They they had actually planned a trip to go to Europe just to tour around Europe. And so the brethren called them and said, well, you're not going to tour around Europe. You're going to go on your trip, but you are going to be missionaries. They called them to be missionaries mm -hmm. in England. And, of course, the young women were dutiful and loved the Lord. And so they said, okay, that's what we'll do. <laughs> not to give out any secrets, but what was their experience like? I imagine it had ups and downs. Mm -hmm. So much. Yeah, they, they ran into some real persecution physical persecution, not only, you know, uh, the words and stuff were, that were thrown at them, but also actual things thrown at them and, mm. you know, just animosity. So they had to deal with a lot. Mm. But, yeah. Overall, helpful in changing the perception of what uh, mm -hmm. the Mormon sisters are really all. Oh, yeah. They, they really gathered a lot of people, especially women, that saw, oh, well, these aren't slovenly, you know, illiterate stooges under the thumb of their husbands because that's the perception yeah. now these are intelligent women so mm. let's talk about your latest project or can I, a novella what what's what have you got in the works <laughs> this is a little complicated okay this is a, a departure for me this is a contemporary women's fiction it deals with uh the f youngest college professor in the nation at 19 years old Paige Jaw, and she's from she's from Indian descent from India, and it's just her dealing with not only um, the idea of being young in a situation where her peers are all tenured and oh, yeah. and they have you know that problem with her, but she is on the autism spectrum a bit, mm -hmm. so she has to deal with that and overcome that, and it's I love it. It's a great book. I mean I. You can say you love your own work. <laughs> you can. <laughs> what, what put you in that direction? What do you think? I it's don't a, know. a departure from what you've been uh, yeah, doing for a while. I don't know, truly. The Lord just put that into my brain. And I had other projects that I was thinking about mm -hmm. after Sister Preachers, but for some reason, this one is, yeah. So, yeah, she teaches up in a college in Washington State, which is very liberal, and she's quite conservative. And so there's that conflict also so there's a lot going on and the final thing about it <laughs> she was raised by anarchist parents oh, wow. so there you go <laughs> <laughs> you got all things going on and that's, yeah. you know, that's gonna be fun to read uh you know as you look back on all the things that you've done you know you mentioned serendipity like two or three or four times but uh how have you you know obviously you've seen the hand of the lord guiding you along in this process mm -hmm. as you've been uh, you know writing to whatever you're doing at this point yeah all the time. There, there isn't a time where I haven't felt that uh, love and that comfort and that direction. Um, it's only when I get crazy and try and get into my own head that I run into trouble. Mm -hmm. But with him, it's always peaceful and everything. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but 13 years ago, our son passed away. Mm -hmm. We have a son and a daughter, and um, that was just, of course, dreadful and, and hurtful, and your heart just aches. But there again, the Spirit of the Lord comforts and guides. And, you know, Brian, we don't understand always why. It's like I, I tell people that I when I go to book clubs, <clears throat> it's like we're looking at the backside of a tapestry, and it's all these threads and everything, and we don't understand. But one day the Lord will turn that tapestry around and we'll see the reason and the, how it all fits together. So that's kind of how I live my life, you know, with that, with that feeling of whatever I do. Yeah, I love that description. Well, thanks so much for coming. Gail Sears, author, will check, oh, check for the novella coming out. It should be fun to read. I hope. <laughs> I have to find an agent or something if there's any agents out there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gail, thanks so much for taking the time. Oh, it's been absolutely. a pleasure. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.